you feel more at home over there than you do here. There, you're doing your job. You're, you're trained to do it. You're doing it every day. You come back here and you sort of feel like you're sitting in limbo. You just want to get back over and keep doing what you're there to do. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst the children. children. Going to a I could never often. not go back. They were my friends and they felt the trouble of us. She did and say, so. you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. Mark Noble was an explosive detection dog handler. He was an engineer in the Incident Response Regiment, which became the Special Operations Engineer Regiment. He deployed to Afghanistan, integrated in missions with the 2nd Commando Regiment. This is his conversation with Rohan Viswalingam of Thistle Productions. A story. A man fires a rifle for many years and he goes to war. And afterwards he comes home and he sees that whatever else he might do with his life, build a house, love a woman, change his son's diaper, he will always remain a jarhead. And all the jarheads killing and dying, they will always be me. We are still in the desert. I'm Rohan. Uh, I'm with Mark Noble today on uh, Life on the Line podcast. Uh, that was the ending lines of uh, Jarhead, a film of uh, US Marines in the Gulf War. How are you going, Mark? Good, Rohan. Yourself? Yeah, very well. So uh, we'll start. Yeah, just tell us a bit about yourself, where you grew up, family, that sort of stuff. Mate, I grew up uh, here in the Southern Highlands. I was born in uh, Barrow Hospital. I had uh, Two sisters and a brother, all younger. Went to the local school here in Mossvale. Studied to year 10, where I decided to leave and, and I was going to go on and do some work with my family, contracting business. I then went on and I thought, oh, what am I going to do? I can't do this. And I thought I wanted to do a trade. So I started looking at trades and, and what I was going to do and nothing really interested me. And I was sitting at home one day and seeing an ad come on for the, for the army. I thought to myself, that looks interesting. From country guy, I hadn't really seen much of that sort of stuff growing up here. So I, I got the paperwork and started filled it out and said to mum and dad, oh, I think I'm going to join the army. How did that go down? You know, they saw, they took it pretty well. Obviously, no one had really done it before from my family. So it was a first and I went down to Wollongong and done the tests. I didn't really know what I was going to do. Didn't really know what jobs were there as such. So they give me a list of what I could do and I, I seen the combat engineer role and I thought, well, that suits me pretty well. That sounds interesting, you know, explosives, building bridges, stuff like that. So I thought, oh, yeah, that looks good. So I put my paperwork in and and that was the role that I took on. Went on from there and went to Kapuka in January 2005. So how long was that whole that whole process from like walking in the door and then heading off to Kapuka? Oh, honestly, I, I can't remember right now, but it wasn't it wasn't very long. Uh, I was only 17 at the time, just out of school, and I joined when I was 17. Couldn't have been very long because when I turned 17 in May and I joined in January 2005, yeah. so maybe about six months. What's Kapuka like, first exposure to the... Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first exposure for me was when I, I caught a bus from Wollongong to Sydney to, I can't remember the name of the hotel, it was at the airport. And I, I walked inside, there was not really anyone there at the time. I got told my room was such and such a number. So I've gone up, got settled into my room, 17 year old, I thought this is pretty cool. Yeah, next minute I had a knock on the door. Oh, who's this knocking on my door? I opened up and there was a sergeant standing there. And he rambled on a few words. I thought, who's this guy, you know? I didn't really know anything about it at the time. He went on a bit and I walked downstairs and went outside and was standing around. Next minute, some more people rocked up and some more people rocked up. And next minute, I know we're all getting yelled at and 
told we had to be at such and such at six o'clock and I, I didn't really know what was going on, you know. And went from there, we all got on the bus straight down to Wagga. I can't remember if it was a corporal or a sergeant, military police guy walked onto the bus and he just told everyone to get off the bus quick, smart, get your bags. And then from there, we just remember trottling off to our rooms, carrying our suitcases. And that was the start of my army experience. Yeah, right. So what was exactly... Um your role that you trained in in Kapuka and then finished up as? I was training as a combat engineer, Royal Australian Engineers. Yep. Once I finished at Kapuka, I, I went down to the School of Military Engineering in Moorbank. That was the IET course for the engineers there. Completed that and I was posted to the Incident Response Regiment in Holsworthy. So you've completed your, your IET. What happens next in terms of your army journey after that? I, I completed my IETs. I, I was fortunate enough to be posted to the incident response regiment where our combat engineers would generally go to one CER in Darwin, combat engineer regiment, three CER in Townsville or two CER in Brisbane. At the time, there was the incident response regiment in Sydney, Holsworthy. I was fortunate enough to be posted in there. They worked on a CBR role, chemical, biological, radiological. I went in there and that was, it was more counterterrorism stuff, more domestically than foreign at the time, working with gas, chemical weapons, chemical warfare. That was what we'd done yeah, right. in the short term while I was there. What were the guys like that you were posted with your unit? Great. All the guys I served with over my time, I, was, I feel very fortunate and very lucky to have served with such good people, to be honest. Uh, very professional, especially at the unit. It was quite a, a high level, elite sort of unit. And, it, and it, down the track, and, and when we will get there, it did turn into an elite, elite unit. Tell me about um, your dog handling stuff and how that transpired. Did you see yourself moving into dog handling or did it just sort of... I didn't at the start. Um, and, and during the IAT course, uh, you, you're giving demonstrations of all the different things that engineers do. And the dog dogs is one of them. And I still remember the first day I seen them. We're all standing out at a big open soccer field and this dog truck pulls up and he gets out with his dog and I thought have a go at this guy he's got the life eh <laughs> and, and I watched him he's got his dog out and he starts giving his commands and the dog searching the the soccer field and the dog sits and he gets a tennis ball and away they go and they're like oh that's the explosive detection dog team you know you won't get there but anyway so I've seen that now I got posted to the incident response regiment and I was doing that for a while and I sort of just I wasn't really into the role that I was doing, I guess. And I, I knew that the dog course was coming up. They run one each year. I thought, oh, I'm going to apply for it. So I, I applied and I, I got onto the dog handlers course in 2008 and went over to the School of Military Engineering and completed that. What was the training like for the dog handlers course? Uh, it was quite a good course. You don't course. get to choose your dog, do you? No, you don't get to choose your dog yet. When you're learning to be a handler, you're teamed up with, a, obviously, a trained dog. You firstly need to get the bond with the dog, spend a lot of time with the dog initially to get that bond. And from there, you start to learn your husbandry, your health, searching, how to read your dog and progresses along. And you learn like the, the searching techniques. I think that goes for three months of dog handlers course. So you tell us about your dog. Uh, well, I actually had a couple of dogs over my time. You'd be very lucky to keep the same dog for the whole period of your army career. But I firstly had a dog, Mandy, little Kelpie Cross, beautiful dog. I loved her. Uh, so I had her for a while and I ended up, uh, there's Jeb, Border Collie. That's Jeb. Uh, so I had Mandy for a little while um, and I ended up, there was this Jeb and he was a bit of a nuisance. <laughs> very, yeah. very stubborn dog. He's quite hard to, to handle. I ended up getting him a bit of a way through the course and he like he really tested me to get through the course yeah like he was hard but once i got the bond with him and i spent a bit of time with his old handler and learned quite a few things and and i went on to keep him and we got through the course and i took him over to instrument response regiment and so they were the first two or jeb was the first real dog that i had and i then went on to take him overseas in 2009. tell me about that your first first deployment yeah, that was an interesting deployment. That was 2009. Uh, I think I deployed in February, if I'm correct. Uh, I went over a little bit earlier than the rest of the team. Obviously, being, I was 21 years old, quite excited. Uh, trained, you know, everyone gets in, you want to go and do that Get job. Keen, yeah. It's quite keen. I spent a lot of time with Jeb. Actually, I'll just fly back for a second. And with our dogs, we were trained, they're trained to air scent. Our dogs were never, they were mine dogs back in the day, and we went right away from that. These explosive detection dogs were trained to air scent, so not track along the ground. When we deployed to Afghanistan, you had to change that. 
obviously with IEDs, explosive things buried in the ground, you needed your dog to, to ground scent. So it was quite a task for us to get the dog to go from an air scenting dog to a ground scenting dog. So that was the first part of my deployment was getting Jeb to scent Sniff along the, the ground. ground. And that was quite difficult and it took quite a long time to get the dog to, to keep his nose on the ground, following commands, being getting him to read the different scents. Obviously on the ground, there's a lot more scent than there is in the air picture. And so that was quite a long process and I'll jump over to where I was before. So when we deployed, I went a little bit earlier. And that was to get the dog uh, used to the different scents over there, getting ground scenting in country. How did he react? Uh, he was actually quite quite good. Um, he, he picked it up pretty quickly. You do have a little bit of a problem with the dogs when they are ground scenting. They'll tend to want to pour because they want to get more scent yeah. out of the ground. Obviously with IEDs and pressure plates, it's not ideal. So we had to sort of get them out of that very quickly and, and very early to stop anything from happening, which most of the dogs... No, we didn't have a problem with that. So I got over there and, and started training with the guys in country, doing a lot of work on base. And eventually the rest of my team and the force element arrived. We got prepared and we started to get into it, yeah. How would you react to getting there yourself? Oh, I still remember being on the Herc, the C-130 flying in there. I flew nearly all the way over by myself with Jeb. And I still remember flying in and that ramp coming down and the dust flying in the back of the C-130 and the smell was just, I thought, what is this place? <laughs> uh, it absolutely stunk, the burn pit. And, you know, I walked out and it was, everything has starts to happen really quickly. You know, you, you start to look around and, you know, the mountains and it's just a dust bowl. And so I went on and, and I don't really remember a whole lot in that short period from when I walked off because everything just happened so fast. You just shipped in into a vehicle and away you go up to your accommodation. So uh, I don't really remember that a whole lot. Tell me about um, experiences in your first deployment. Being a 21-year, it was quite uh, intense deployment. First mission we went out on, I think we went out on the 16th or the 17th of March. Don't quote me on it. It's one of them days. Went out and we were going for a long, long mission. We were out for just about three weeks, made it been a tad over. And so we went out, we had to drive the whole way being young guys, you know, we left at night. I remember sitting in the back of the Bushmaster with the dog and the rest of the team. God, oh, the feeling when you drove out of that gate was just surreal. You didn't know where you were going, what was going to happen. So we pushed out through the night and we had to start and get out and search. Uh, it was dark and I was just like, the first time I stepped out of that vehicle with the dog, I was like, wow, this, where am I? What's going to happen? Yeah. Just switch on and, and do the job. And it, it took the dog a little bit to, to settle in and, and get going. Obviously working in night vision goggles and it's pitch black. It was cold. So we started to search and, and we searched for about two days. When we got to the morning of the 19th of March, the sun had not long come up. The boys had found, I was in the back of the vehicle with the dog at this time. The boys had been out searching. They, they'd had a hit on the ground. Um, we're in the middle of the... Chembrack Pass, quite a big, long valley. There was only one way through. Our EOD tech, Sergeant Brett Till, uh, went down to, you know, render the device. He set a charge, come back to the vehicle, uh, went back down to blow the device, and, and unfortunately he was, the device exploded and he was killed instantly. Being out for two days and something like that happening, it was just tore us to pieces. We had to secure the area, wait for the chopper to come in, send Brett back home. We waited there for a little while and then we had to just push on. You know, we'd lost our sergeant. We were quite a young team. Uh, so we had to push on and eventually we did. Uh, I think, I mean, my mind's a bit blown. I think we stayed in position overnight and then pushed on early the next morning. Continued through the rest of the valley and over the, through that stretch of pass, I think we found 18 IEDs. Oh, wow. There's a photo there of the terrain. You can see how steep it is. Uh, yeah. we, we had to push up this quite steep hill. So I started, got the dog out, it's very rocky. The vehicles could only just fit up the track. And we got, I was searching up with the dog, we got about halfway and I looked across and the dog, dog paid some interest in the ground. There was a hole cut out of the, the rock. They'd obviously, I don't know how they'd done it, perfect square hole to place a 20 litre palm oil container into. And just across from that was a pressure plate hole. This carved out a solid rock. You know, they and, and we turned around and there was a battery pack uh, sitting on the rock. So we, we'd obviously disturbed them in, in the process of trying to get that IED in place. 
So we sorted all that out and we continued up and it was only, I mean, it wasn't very much further, maybe a hundred meters, maybe. We were searching, I'd send the dog out, the two search guys would use their metal detectors, clearing the track and, and they got to a point and stopped and I said, I'll go and stand on that rock and I'll push Jeb up from there. It's a big rock and you're nothing gonna be there. Stood on the rock and I cast him out and as he sort of ran out, maybe a half a meter in front of me, his feet sunk down into the dirt. And I thought, what's going on here? And he sort of stopped and had a bit of a sniff and he went up and he come back and he comes straight to that spot and his feet sunk even further in. I just, I remember grabbing him and pulling him and carried him back. And that was actually a 30 kilo charge oh, of <laughs> Ampho, ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. I, I mean, I don't think he would have set that off. He was, that hole was actually the main charge. The pressure plate was over to the right, you know, but that was, especially after just coming through that whole pass and, and finding so many IEDs and going through losing Brett uh, and coming up that, that pass. So it was perfectly placed to hit the vehicle and it would have just flipped straight down the hill. Yeah. So they, they're quite smart in their placement of these things. Very smart. So what sort of, um, so you're talking about ampho? Ammonium nitrate. Yeah, right. What, what other like, um, I guess like setups did they, did they use? Uh, munitions. You'd find anything, any tank mines, mm. a lot of mines, a lot of munitions, 105 rounds. They, they'd pretty much use anything that was going to blow you up, anything that was going to hurt you, anything. They would use anything, everything and anything they would use that, that would damage or, or severely hurt us in some way, yeah. What was like the biggest payload you found? Oh, explosive-wise, you wouldn't get much more than 30 kilos in an IED generally because, it, you know, they didn't need any more than that. 30 kilos is going to do a lot of damage. So generally they wouldn't use a whole lot more than that. I don't remember finding anything much bigger than 20 to 30 kilos. That was probably one of the biggest ones that I remember. In my little book here, I was reading through the other day and I, I'd searched Jebs for times 14 kilometers, 11 kilometers, overnight eight and a half hours searching, you know, and this went on for three weeks. Uh, over the course of this mission that we were on, Damien Tomlinson lost his legs uh, not long after we lost Brett. And so it was, you know, for only being in Afghanistan for a couple of weeks and, you know, being 21 and being out on our first job, there was quite a lot that happened in that short amount of time. Uh, and being out for that amount of time and these things happening, you sort of put them behind you very quickly. You just got to get on with the job. You got to move forward. There's guys that rely on you. You can't just sit around and dread on it, Take I guess. Out, yeah, yeah, you can't. You just got to move forward. So in a way, it was sort of a good thing we were out for that long. But in a way, obviously, we, we lost Brett and Damien had his incident. So it was, we took the, the good with the bad, I guess. So how are you feeling about um, your deployment after those first few hurdles? Honestly, I, I didn't really think about it a whole lot. By the time we got back to base after such a long mission, there were so many things that happened. You know, yeah, we, we spent a bit of time remembering Brett and talking, telling a few stories, but it wasn't long after that we were back out again. You don't get time to sit around and think about this stuff you just gotta you gotta keep going yeah what sort of weapons do you use uh we were carrying the m4 carbon i carried a pistol most of the time as it was just a lot easier for me to search with the dog this was more in 2011 and 12 than 2009 but yeah generally a m4 and a pistol our unit back then the incident response regiment in 2009 that, which is what it was after after this uh deployment it sort of paved the way for where the unit went and where it is now uh, back then it was the incident response regiment it, it eventually turned into the special operations engineer regiment and it was a lot of it was paved through the work that the search has done on this deployment after brett was killed you know the, our role had changed were heavily integrated with the commandos and the sas teams it eventually went on to where it is now it's it's up there with the Special Operations Task Group. And the SO Command, you know, these guys are at an elite level. They've gone to being fully integrated with these commando teams and SAS guys. And it just it paved the way and made the unit change from where it was to, to where it is now. Interhastus et hostis is the motto of that, which is between enemy and spears, which is essentially what myself and these search guys were doing you're out in front between the rest of the patrol and the enemy paving that way clearing that route clearing that building whatever we had to do so as it was safe for these guys to go in and do their work tell us about uh anzac day 
2009. Yeah, Anzac Day 2009. It was a very, very memorable and moving day. We'd not long got back from our mission after losing Brett incident with Damien. And I remember getting up and, and going down, getting ready for the dawn service and, you know, just looking out and it, it was pitch black and you, you can see the mountains, the sun starts to rise up behind you. The dawn service, the last post playing, soldiers and st- every, guys everywhere in uniform. And it was, I remember getting goosebumps and I still get them now thinking about it, of how surreal it was to stand in that place and look out over the mountains as the sun was coming up, listening to the last post being played after what we're just going through them incidents. And it, it was an Anzac day I'll never, ever forget, that's for sure. And I, I doubt that I'll ever get the feelings for another Anzac day like I did on that day. That was probably the day that I really remembered Brett and, you know, had had a lot of time and, and thought about him and obviously the rest of the wars and the conflicts over time, but it was that was probably my day for remembering him. What was Brett like? He was a character. He had a heart of gold, mate. He, if someone could make you laugh, he'd make you laugh. You know, he's a bit of a joke. To, uh, he, he was pretty quiet sort of guy in a way, but, yeah, you can see his big cheesy grin he's got there. You know, he's a lovely guy. He had kids and wife? Yeah, he did. Pre his wife at the time, she was pregnant when he was killed, unfortunately. No, I, I speak to Bree quite a lot. We still stay in touch and in contact. And uh, when we come home, we went and done some work uh, with Better Homes and Gardens and made over the house for her, the backyard. And that was myself and the team, the search team. We went and done that. And that was, you know, just giving Bree something, knowing how hard it was for her and the kids to go through at that time to be able to go and give them something and make their home a little bit more comfortable after going through something so tragic and it definitely made me feel a little bit better and you know i I think it definitely helped them out as well how long was your first deployment uh first deployment was five months i come home in june what was that like coming up in june after your first stint yeah it was good it was good to come home but it wasn't long after being home that i wanted to go back i missed it you feel more at home over there than you do here there you're doing your job you're you're trained to do it you're doing it every day you come back here and you sort of feel like you're sitting in limbo you just want to get back over and keep doing what you're there to do so it wasn't till I come back home and I actually was lucky enough to to get put on a supervisor's course which is a dog trainer's course I completed that and that had not long finished and I got the news that we were going to deploy again in 2011 so from there, it was just a preparation, pre-deployment training, getting ready to go. So as soon as that starts, you start to hype yourself up. You're like, yeah, we're going back. You know, you're just like counting down the days till that date, date arrives. Yeah. What were your excitement levels at when you went for that second deployment? Oh, I was really excited. Quite a few mates that were deployed on the rotation before me. And I think we had about six or seven weeks before we deployed. I still remember the morning very clearly. I had a phone call from a mate. I was about six o'clock in the morning. He said, you better come to work, mate. And I said, what are you talking about? Sapper Ron Robertson had been killed. Me and him were very, very good friends. Oh, I jumped up in hysterics, drove to work, got in there and everyone was having a meeting. And I, I just remember sitting there and I thought to myself, I can't sit around here for the next six weeks and wait to go. I was like, I need to go now. How am I going to do it? Being a dog handler, Rowan was a searcher. I thought they're not going to send me. So I walked into the commanding officer and I said, look, I, I feel I need to go and replace him. And I'm ready to go. My dog's ready to go. He sent me in it. He said, oh, you know, you're a dog handler. They need a searcher. And I'm also a qualified searcher. And and he sort of thought about it. And they come back to me and said, look, we'll we'll send you over. So I I flew up to Queensland. I met Rowan when he arrived back in country, carried him off the plane up there, met his family. That night, I, I flew back to Sydney and jumped on a plane the next morning and flew out to Afghanistan. So back in country and everything just happened very quickly from there on. How did Rowan die? Uh, he was shot. So how are you feeling about your uh, second deployment when you got back over there? I, I didn't have a whole lot of time when I arrived back in country. Rowan obviously was killed. His team was down one man. They needed someone straight away. So I hadn't been back in country. It was only a couple of days and I was straight back out on a chopper and, and into it again. That's what I was going over there for. I wasn't going to sit around camp and whatever else I had. Went straight out and we got back into into work. So that was that was good. Sometimes I took Jeb, sometimes I didn't. More often than not, oh sorry, I didn't have Jeb Shuba. 
Shuba. Shuba. So we got a new dog. New dog. New dog this time. What happens to Jeb after like you swap around or something? Or Yeah, when I went on the supervisor's course, obviously you don't take a new dog. You train your own dogs up over that, that period. Uh, I handed Jeb off. He went to another handler, trained the dog, and this is Shuba. I ended up taking over in 2012, uh, 11, 12. So I trained her up. She passed all the all the tests and, and away we went. Do you work with any um, U.S. Forces or Canada or any other in two thousand in two thousand eleven and twelve our role had changed a lot from what we were doing in two thousand nine and we were primarily working with the DEA fast Nexus operation stuff counter narcotics and I mean that's pretty much all we done for the seven month rotation just flying in hitting targeting drug manufacturing labs drugs whatever else they they would use this money to fund their terrorism, weapons, anything else. Um, so this was quite important to, to do this stuff. We were very, very successful. I've got quite a lot of articles in the cupboard there of drug labs that we hit and the shuba there. I think she found two tons of hash <laughs> hidden in a hay barn. We're not trained, we don't train our dogs on drugs, but such a foreign odor coming out of a, a haystack. Mm. And she just changed the way she was acting and a, a lot more interested than she would have been. I didn't know what it was gonna be, and it didn't take long to find that. So uh, it was a, a pretty good smoke up that day. Well, yeah, like uh, similarities and differences between Shuba and, and Jeb. Oh, completely different dogs. Jeb was a Border Collie, Shuba was a Labrador. You don't have to explain too much there. Yeah. <laughs> Jeb was just flat out and had a mind of his own, whereas Shuba was very laid back and she didn't like going too far away from you. She would, you know, it was Jeb just, he's like, see you, mate, I'm going to do my thing. I'll let you know when there's something going on. <laughs> we went out on a mission. It was a, a DEA fast mission. Who we? I think there was a more one or two of the more commando mortar teams from Bravo Company. We, we went out with the... American DA guys, the Afghan army. So having a look at this village and we, we were searching through and there was not much coming out of it. And then the commando team said, oh, they were going over to search a little compound that was a, at the top of my memory. It would have been about eight or 900 meters away through a cornfield. So they went over and they ended up finding a machine gun set up pointing out the window towards where everyone was. So they called, they wanted me to go over with the dog. Oh, I got the, I think there was two or three of the DA fast guys and about six or eight Afghan army fellas to come over. I'd send the dog through and, and they could do the, the search of the compound. On our way over, there was a commander. He was quite a good friend of mine. He was standing on the roof. I'm getting closer and closer. He's talking to me. And what was his name? Scott. And we were getting closer and I was calling out to him. And on the left, there was some trees and a big aqueduct, like it was a little creek. And it was a bit of a bank and I thought I'm not going that way I'll go around the other way so I've gone to the right and the Afghan fellas have gone to the left and by this time we're only about 10 or 15 meters maybe 20 meters from the compound and I said to Scott I'll come through that way as we I've the Afghan guys and myself pretty much walked over the bank at the same time and as I hit that bank the rounds just started going off and there was a guy sitting down in the creek and as we stepped over, he just started building rounds off and it was just an instantaneous reaction to neutralize the threat and move on from there. And me just being a dog handler, a searcher, having to direct everything from there on in and work with the, the DEA guys, the commando guys that were on the inside. They couldn't come out and we had to get our way in, but no one knew who was sort of in between. So it was quite a... It was quite an intense... Honestly, it went on for quite a while. It was hot. It was the middle of the day. That was intense. Probably one of the memorable, more memorable things out of my two deployments yeah. um, was having to go through all that at that time. What did you feel like for your first first firefight? Oh, I'd been in some before, but never anything like that. The guy, he probably only would have been five metres away. Was he shooting straight at you or suppressive? Sporadic fire. Yeah. I think he heard us before he seen us. And like as I just put my head over, he was just blatting away and I was him down done what i had to do here yeah. and from there on everything just happened really fast i don't know how scott survived standing on the roof why he didn't shoot him i don't know um he doesn't know either no one's seen him and from there we went in and by the time this had all happened we got inside and everything else had just sort of gone by the wayside and it was just a matter of regrouping making sure everyone was all right and getting back over to the main element so yeah that was that was quite an experience one I'll guarantee I'll never ever forget. Yeah, yeah. You said you were in other firefights. What happened with those? Ah, oh, there was quite a few. There were, if you go back to, if anyone's listened to Eddie Robertson's podcast, um, there was a time we, we got ambushed 
he, he mentioned that in there. I was with his team at the time. We weren't out doing a patrol. I think I was second or I might have been the last and he was one or two in front of me. Walking through, next minute it was just a mass explosion. It was an RPG. It had only gone off, oh, I don't know. It wasn't very far behind me. He, Eddie thought that I'd been hit at the time and it, everything happened so fast. The machine guns firing off and we knew where the threat was. The guy had done an awesome job to get around and flank these guys and, and after that, the force elements had come to support us and, and, and we were okay, so... How did you guys deal with um, boredom on base? Was there any long stretches of nothing? Not really, especially in this deployment in 11 and 12. It, it was a full-on deployment. Like it was constantly, nearly every day we were out on a, every night we were out on a mission. Um, these guys had drug labs everywhere. And it wasn't very often you'd go in and hit one, you wouldn't be caught under fire. They It was worth a lot of money to them and they would do whatever they could to, to defend it until we'd overpower them. It was just constant every single day. You might get a couple of days off, but them days off were good. You'd go to the gym, call people back home, just relax. What was the gym like? Unreal. So you've got the, the Tarrant gym yeah, jumper. Yeah, the gyms were unreal. It was really good training and it was funny, like you, you're out working every, like every day or every night and long missions carrying a lot of weight, fighting, and he'd still come back and go to the gym. <laughs> you know, like it was, you just, you had to just keep going. And it was, just, I guess it was a bit of a release, taking your mind off things and, and just moving forward and waiting for the next job. So I well, actually had a funny story. It was about, it was Jeb back in 2009. I forgot about this one. We're, we'd done a lot of training when we were in, on base in camp. And me and the other dog handler, Ben, his name was, we were out training this day. And on, on the base, they had these, obviously, on, in Afghanistan, there's no just toilet things like that. So they've got these that are called ship pits. Massive, big, no, huge. Big, like tenor, bigger than tennis court, longer. What? <laughs> and like a big septic. That's huge. Ship, like they just build the walls up and like uh, you go up the wall and over the other side it was all, all shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I'm out training with Jeb and... Oh, yeah, we have searched down and Ben was there with me and he knew where the hide was. And anyway, Jeb had found this hide and I was, all right, so I get the tennis ball and I'm throwing the tennis ball. I've thrown this tennis ball and it's bounced off a rock, gone up the wall and straight over the other side into the ship pit. And Jeb just took off like a rocket, hit the top of the, the wall and just launched himself. <laughs> And he's gone, gone straight out into this ship pit. And I've just I've gone to Ben. I'm like, how am I going to get him out? And I got up there and he, all he, I could see was his head sticking out. I don't know why. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going in there. So he managed, he come out and he, uh, like this place stunk. Like I'm, you know, it was terrible. There wasn't many places we could train. And uh, we had a little Hilux uh, with a set of dog kennels on the back of it. And I'm like, hey, I'm not lifting him in there. So I just. So you went fully. He was fully in, fully like he launched in, like all that was sticking out was his head. And so he comes out and he's shaking off. I'm like, oh, man. And he comes, I dropped the back tailgate on the Hilux. And I said, I'm not picking him up. And lucky enough, he was a pretty good jumper. So he jumped straight in. I shut the back door and I took him up. And we just, he copped the hose. And oh, it was, I had to hose him a couple of times. Shampoo, hose. And, Yuck. Oh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was pretty disgusting at the time. But, but the more, we were just laughing about it. The more it went on, he's like, oh, I can't believe your dog just jumped in the shit bit. <laughs> so that was... That was a bit of a funny story from uh, our time in the base there, so, yeah. What sort of stuff are you carrying, like, in your pack? Uh, I would always carry, obviously, essentials, your weapons, M4, pistol, ammunition. Always carry explosives, a uh, grenade or two, smoke grenade, uh, and then you go on to your food, water. I would obviously carry a lot of extra water for the dogs. Uh, being so hot over there, 11 and 12, it got, there's a photo somewhere out of a thermometer, it was 55 degrees sitting out in the middle of the, the dash waiting to be picked up to go back to base in the middle of the day. And, you know, I took my shirt off and put it on the dog to – there was no shade, there was nothing. Yeah. Um, so I obviously had to carry a lot of extra waters to the other dog handlers. A lot of extra water for the dogs. And sometimes it got really heavy. Generally, we wouldn't be out much longer than, you know, a day depending, hours, day. A lot of it was all helo helicopter stuff so you'd be go in do your job get picked up and get back out again so tell us about um 
how the dogs help morale boosting while they're over there. And I've got a photo everyone, here of uh, Shuba eating a watermelon <laughs> ev- everyone, while in operation. <laughs> everyone loves a dog. Um, you know, there's not many people that you can't let a dog run around. They yeah. want to pat it. You know, our dogs, we don't pet the dogs. It was a very big thing. But I mean, over the, you're overseas. You're at war. Think bad, terrible things are happening. And I was very fortunate with Jeb. Shuba was quite good as well, but Jeb, he just had a switch. He would switch on and off. He knew when he was working, he knew when he was playing. And after losing Brett and going on, and, and I'd just let Jeb go when we'd settle down into to the harbour, the camp at night, let him off and he'd cruise around and, and you can see him, like you'd see the guys when he, they'd all go, ah, Jeb, Jeb, you know, and he'd go and jump up and he'd hang out with one group of guys for a while and he'd cruise around in the next <laughs> group for a while. and then he'd, Butterfly. Yeah, he was. And then he'd just he'd go on and he'd come back and that was it, you know. And then he knew it was time to work as soon as that harness come out. That went on and, and Shuba there, you know, that was, a, that was a hot day, very hot day. We'd been out for quite a few hours and all we could find was watermelon. Uh, that's one of the commando guys I was with his team at the time. He's got the watermelon and decided to give Shuba some. So, you know, and you see the smile on his face, you know, the guys were all the same. As soon as the dogs were around, they just, the smiles come on their faces and it, it makes a massive difference. Just boosts their morale and takes their mind off where you are and what you're doing and, and things like that. Just for that might only be a split second, but that split second can make a big difference when you're somebody like that. Can't win wars if you don't have morale. No, that's right. <laughs> But in general, like our dogs were not not to be petted or or played with. But you know, in times like that, you make an exception, and yeah. and it, it never really bothered the dogs or turned them off their work. That was the most important thing, as long as they were still working. Right. So it's 2011. Yeah, your last deployment. 2011 moved into 2012. Yeah, and you got come back home in January, February 2012. And after that deployment, I, I was ready to come over for a little while. I was pretty well worn out. It was quite intense, quite a long, physically demanding deployment. And so I come back home and, and got settled back into the unit at the time, had a bit of time off. And Did you get to keep Shuba? Or? Uh, I did for a little while until I decided I was going to discharge the army. Uh, and she went on to a, another handler. I went on to discharge. I've been fortunate enough to get a job uh, doing some contracting in Kabul. I'll jump back to your, your Shuba question there. She she had gone on with another handler. Um, I wasn't sure who, who had her at the time. And I got a phone call. She was getting retired. And they said, did you want to take her? Were you interested? And I, yeah, of course. I loved her. I trained her, took her overseas. Had a very good bond with her. And so the next thing I know, the vehicle comes down and picked her up. Got her home. And I, I'd only had her home for about two weeks. But the time that I had her here, she would not leave my side. What was it like when you first saw each other? It was crazy. It's very hard to explain. She come up and like we hadn't spent any time apart. How long had it been? Would have been about two or three years, I would say. Three years. Yeah, and, and from that time on, she just never left my side. She'd sit around me anywhere. If I'd turn around, she'd be under my feet, walking around, follow me around the farm on the bike. And it, she, it was great. And I, I was at the farm here one day and I was on the bike with Shuba and my cattle dog and I was doing some stuff with the cattle and my sister and a partner had come to the farm and they were following me down. I was on the bike and they followed me down the driveway and he obviously didn't see Shuba running behind me and and run over and unfortunately she was killed. Uh, by the time I could get her back and get her into the vet, I definitely broke the law that day. I think I was doing about 150 or 160 driving 15 minutes into town to the vet and I'd called them on the way in there and I knew she she passed away about halfway between here and there and I still didn't give up hope. I remember carrying her in, kicking the front door open and sitting her on the table and the lady come out and she said, oh, you know, we can't can't do anything, she's gone. So that, that broke my heart. I was, I was a fair mess for a while after that. And I, I got her cremated and she sits here on my little mantelpiece now with her, with her collar and a harness and, and yeah, every time she's... Just, just good memories to keep of her, and she saved a lot of lives, and, and she done a great job while she was over there. You see the two tons of hash that she's got there, very <laughs> proudly with. How did um, the rest of you guys you served with? How did they deal with coming back home? Well, there's a lot of guys that are still in the unit. Most of the guys that I served with here in 2009 from my search team, most of them are out now, all gone their separate ways. I still stay in contact with them here and there. You know, you lose contact with guys over over time. You might speak to them once every 12 months, generally on a Brett's 
anniversary or Anzac Day, they're, they're quite close together. It's generally around that time every year you get a message or you flick a message off and, you know, these guys are going to remember them forever. We went through a lot together and spent a lot of time living together, not showering for three weeks. <laughs> um, you know, but nothing's going to break that bond that you have with these guys. Tell me more about um, how partners play into supporting you and getting you through like tough times and that. When you get out of it, which is oh, I can't really go on while I, while I was in because I never really had a partner. But after getting out, they're they're a rock. Like you, you know, your emotions, you start to have mental issues, breakdowns, things start to come back into your mind, especially when you get out of the army. And these girls, these partners, husbands, if they are, they're just a rock. Like they, what they have to go through and they they deal with and put up with is a true credit to them. You know, they put up with you know attitudes and you know meltdowns. And and whatever else might go on, like they, the guys need this support. They need them there. If they're not, they're not there. I don't know. You get a bit lost Floating in yourself. In yeah, you do. And it's just a true credit to the girls and wives and husbands for supporting us and and everyone else. Some guys aren't so fortunate. I've lost three or four mates since I've come home that I've deployed with to suicide. Who are they? There was not so long ago, uh, Jude Duncan Garland. Commando and Turner, also Commando, high, elite, elite soldiers. Some of the best soldiers I've ever worked with. Jude was actually an engineer back in the day before he transferred over to Commandos. I'm pretty sure he was the first combat engineer to take on selection and go over to Commandos. He held quite highly with, with his colleagues and, and the same as Ian. They're elite soldiers. I remember being with them over there and you just go, man, these guys are... Like they're the next level. Come home and these things just build up and get to a point and, you know, they sadly enough feel that there's no other option there. And, you know, it's terrible. I, it upsets me now just talking about it, but I really don't know what more you can do to help these guys out. And it, it is hard and their partners support them as much much as they can and you know there's just still some things, underlying things that are deep down, the demons and, you know, there's something happens and they come out and... And they're gone. Yeah, it's, it's surreal. It's like I was um, uh, reading a book by a, a journalist who was embedded with US troops a few years ago in the Corongal Valley. Uh, and he talks about how it's hard for, hard for soldiers to come back home because they're coming from, you know, you're part of a tight family, you know, tighter than any, anything, you know, you could ever, ever find here. Yeah, you are. And you're, you're, you're useful, mm-hmm. 100% useful, and everyone needs each other in like an equal amount, you know, like a tribe. That's what the book's called. Um, and then you come back and suddenly the family is gone. Gone, it's pulled apart. Yeah, and you're, you're coming back to a society that has less and less of a sense of community and, and brotherhood. You do miss that. One of the biggest things, which is not so long ago that I've started to realize, you lose yourself. It's hard to accept who you are now. You know, you're not that elite soldier that you were five, six, seven years ago. You know, accepting that and accepting who you are now is probably one of the biggest and the hardest things to deal with, but accepting it and moving forward is is a key to it. And it's very important. Yeah, but you've you come back and your family's you do you are hundred percent correct. Your family feels pulled apart. And especially moving back home or guys moving to all different places, spots in the country here and there. You're away from that brotherhood and that mateship mm. that you've you've been however long you've served, how long you've been in for. It's all gone, and you you got to try and look and find that again. It's pretty hard. It is hard. <laughs> it is hard. Everyone, like, you might go back to your hometown, you've been gone for 10 years. People change. Yeah, like, what the hell you happens know? now? <laughs> people change. Like, people move on. There's different people around. Everything's different. Uh, so you've got to learn to, to accept that and find a new way of getting on with your life. Do people ask about your service? Not really. Some people do. Some people don't. My close friends, you know, obviously my close friends down here have been – close with them my whole life. So they, over my army career, I'm always, you know, staying in touch with them, talking to them about it. But it's not until sort of recently, I guess, I've had quite a few injuries and things going on. And I find it's more doctors or when you go into different places like the medical center, things like that, they sort of start to, I've obviously got a tut on my hand there, lest we forget the rising sun. They'll see that and start to ask questions. And it sort of just leads into telling different stories and things and and it does help a lot a lot of people won't talk and i think talking is one of the biggest things to to helping guys out help you get through it yeah
There's more to go between Mark and Rohan, but before they wrap up, I wanted to share an additional anecdote with you. After recording, Mark realised we hadn't discussed Ben Quilty, the famous Australian artist. Mark wrote to me, and these are his words about Ben. He lived in my hometown of Robertson. Ben was in Afghanistan while I was deployed in 2011-12, and I was informed over a phone call that he was there doing his work. By that time, I had found out Ben had returned to Australia. On returning, I was in contact with Ben, and he invited me to his studio in Robertson. After meeting up with him and asked if it would be okay to do a painting of myself, I thought there would be some good that could come from it, so I happily went along. After settling into his studio, very intimidating at first, as he paints his subjects basically raw, I began to tell him my story, and before I knew it, the artwork was completed. A couple of hours later, I must admit. It was a very surreal experience, and was the first time I had really spoken of my time deployed. I felt a real weight lifted off my shoulders. Ben and I became quite good mates, and he went on to paint a second piece of artwork, which he has kept for himself, and it is now hanging in his house. The original painting was a part of the After Afghanistan exhibit that toured the country. The painting has now been donated to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra. I was very honoured and grateful to meet Ben. He has a way with listening, and getting a person to open up and tell their story. I guess it comes from his genuine caring for people. Now... Back to the interview with Mark. What do you miss most of your time in the army? I miss the time with the dogs. I miss the brotherhood, the mateship. I enjoyed the routine. Yeah, especially just the dogs. I, I loved my job in the army at the time. I just I had to get out. Um, I'd had enough. But the longer you go on, you look back at your photos and you miss every single little bit, bit of it. You know, there's not one part of my army career I, I don't regret or not miss. So I missed a whole lot of it. Uh, it was, I loved it. Yeah, I'm nearly too old to go back now, I think. In your idea, what makes a good soldier? You know, you've got to have, you've got to have willpower. You've got, to, you've got to be very determined, a lot of patience, discipline. If you can do your job and you know what your role is and, and you just do it to the best of your ability, well, you're going to be a good soldier. Thanks, Mark Noble. I'm Rohan. This is Life on the Line, signing off.